Good evening and welcome. Special welcome to the folks who are watching online. It's good for us to be together for worship wherever we happen to be. Some announcements as we begin. We'll be hosting Trunk or Treat again this year on October 16th from 2 to 4. This is a wonderful event where we get to welcome and interact with folks in the community. And there are a variety of ways for you to participate. Uh, bring a child, a grandchild, a neighbor kid to enjoy the activities. We could really use people to help with uh, decorating a car. That's where we didn't quite have as many last year. Uh, this could be yourself, it could be a friend. We're accepting candy donations this week to help those who might run out on the 16th. You can leave candy donations in the wooden box outside the church office. Uh, we could use volunteers to help serve food, to help with pumpkin decorating, or just people to be here and help St. John be a good host. So I hope you're able to join us. Committee night is this Thursday at 7. We meet in the church basement for a short devotion and then break to do committee work. Even if you're not on a committee, we'd like to invite you to join us and we'll find a place to plug you in. Also, this weekend is your last opportunity to buy tickets for the quilts and participate in the raffle. The blanket ladies will be in the narthex following worship, and then the drawing will be this Tuesday. Our faith practice reading this week was from Psalm 78. In this psalm of praise, what is, the, what is it that we will not hide from our children in verse 4? Anyone get that? Oh, you're missing out on a peanut butter. Okay, go ahead, Beverly, you got it? Yes, and what our ancestors have told us is the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Very good. Be sure to grab your peanut butter ghost on your way out. All right. And our readings each week are sequential, so this coming week will be in Psalm 79. Will you please stand for our opening song? As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. Together, let us confess our sins. God of healing, God of wholeness, we bring our brokenness, our sinfulness, our fears and despair, and lay them at your feet. God of healing, God of wholeness, 
We hold out hearts and hands, minds and souls to feel your touch and know the peace that only you can bring. God of healing, God of wholeness, this precious moment in your presence and power grant us faith and confidence that here broken lives are made whole. People of God, you are loved and forgiven. This is the good news of deliverance for those who trust. God has healed broken relationships, given power for our discipleship, and given us a new picture of our own worth. The power of God through the Spirit dwells within us and makes us whole. We no longer need to be burdened by our sin and brokenness, but can stand strong and rejoice in the healing and wholeness God has freely given. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading is from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my Lord were with a prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to give death or life, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar? the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man, of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Here ends the first reading. The second reading is from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David, that is my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is sure. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. <clears throat> if we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, 
He remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does no good but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Here ends the second reading. We stand for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 17th chapter. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean, but the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. As you may know, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, a form of Greek that's no longer used, but it was Greek. My point is, sometimes there's more than one way to translate a word or a phrase. Now, with that in mind, I had a seminary professor who said that for preachers, using the original Greek was like wearing underwear. It's good that you have it on, but nobody wants to see it. So for that reason, and because listening to preachers go on and on about Greek words is boring, I try not to talk about how the original Greek was translated this way and this is what it means and blah, blah, blah. I figure if it puts me to sleep, it'll probably put you to sleep too. That professor was very wise. Nobody wants to see it. But at the risk of being boring and perhaps rude, I want to break my own rule and tell you what's underneath. The Greek word that's translated has made you well is sezokasen, from the Greek word sozo, which has the basic meaning of to rescue from danger and restore to a former state of safety and well-being, which is kind of a lot for one word. Therefore, it's translated with words like save, heal, made whole, depending on how the danger is understood. The folks who translated this verse in our reading today figured that leprosy was the danger, and therefore, sezokasen, the rescue, was to be made well. But given the other options for translation, this could also read, get up and go on your way, your faith has saved you. Now, I risk being boring and rude so that I can share an observation. In our reading, Jesus makes the pronouncement, your faith has rescued you from danger and restored you to a former state of safety and well-being, only to one of the men who was healed. So what about the other nine? What healed them? What made them well? well obviously, the answer is Jesus. Jesus healed all ten men from their leprosy. Regardless of their faith, all ten received cleansing from Jesus. So it would seem that faith is not a prerequisite to being healed. But what's the deal with the one who came back? All ten were cured of their leprosy, so when Jesus says, your faith has healed you, he must have intended something more than the absence of disease. 
Clearly, all 10 lepers were healed of their disease. The Samaritan, however, was not only cleansed, but on account of his faith, he gained something more, something that the other nine didn't get. And that something was sezokasen, salvation, healing, wholeness. By faith, the Samaritan was enlightened. He was made aware of the role and person of Jesus. Now, he was healed of his physical skin disease, but also of his spiritual blindness. He was saved from the darkness of the world. Faith allowed the Samaritan to see who Jesus is and to see the kingdom of God breaking into our world. Now, some have criticized the other nine for not praising God. I may even have preached on that in the past, but we don't really know that they didn't. Maybe the other nine were just following the rules. Being good Jews, they were headed to the temple to show themselves to a priest. That is, after all, exactly what Jesus told them to do. So maybe they thanked God when they were there. We don't know what happened after they walked away, other than that they were made clean. The difference between the nine and the Samaritan, the one, by faith, was able to see. He was able to make the connection that Jesus had done this thing. He knew who Jesus was. He saw Jesus as an instrument of God. His newfound sight enabled him to worship God at the feet of Jesus. That's an important observation because learning to see is the key for all of us. Origen of Alexandria once remarked that holiness is seeing with the eyes of Christ. Robert Barron puts it another way. Christianity is, above all, a way of seeing. Everything else in Christian life flows from and circles around the transformation of vision. Christians see differently. And that's why their prayer, their worship, their action, their whole way of being in the world has a distinctive accent and flavor, which flows from Jesus of Nazareth. As Rabbi Harold Kushner writes in his book, Who Needs God? Religion is not primarily a set of beliefs, a collection of prayers, or a series of rituals. Religion is first and foremost a way of seeing. It can't change the facts about the world we live in, but it can change how we see those facts, and that in itself can make a huge difference. Many years ago, I went on a mission trip to Mexico. I spent a week with a group from my aunt and uncle's church building concrete block a house. It was a one-room structure, 11 by 26, made entirely out of cinder block and poured concrete. There was no running water, but it did have a fixture for a light bulb in the center of the room. This house, which was about the same size as a one-car garage that many of us would fill with junk instead of a car, was to be home for a woman and her three children. And they were so amazingly grateful to have it. In addition to helping this woman achieve her dream of owning her own home, some good things came out of that trip. Among them was my ability to be more thankful for the many things I often overlook living in the United States. Flush toilets, for example. They had a pit dug into the rock, a crude outhouse that they shared with neighbors. Running water, those who had running water couldn't drink it because of the crude outhouses. I learned to appreciate paved roads, honest police, a judicial system, electricity, the list goes on. Now, before the trip, I was kind of like the nine lepers. I'd been graced by God in many ways, 
but I didn't always recognize the source of such blessings. That trip opened my eyes, so to speak. It helped me appreciate the many things I take for granted, and it reminded me of the need to give thanks. Luther's explanation to the first article of the Creed in his small catechism captures the essence of this text. Luther writes, I believe that God has created me and all that exists. God has given me and still preserves my body and soul with all their powers. God provides me with food and clothing, home and family, daily work, and all I need from day to day. God also protects me in times of danger and guards me from every evil. All this God does out of fatherly and divine goodness and mercy, though I do not deserve it. Therefore, I surely ought to thank and praise, serve and obey God. This is most certainly true. All people have been created by God. Many people, most Americans, have food and clothing, home and family, daily work. They have all they need from day to day. God protects many people, believers and non-believers alike, in times of danger and guards them from evil. No one deserves this, yet God's fatherly and divine goodness and mercy touches many, many people. How are Christians, how are believers, different from the rest of the human population? It's not that we get more blessings, but rather we're like that one leper. By faith, we see the blessings for what they are. We recognize God's hand in the good that we have. We respond with thanks and praise to God. We respond by serving and following God through Jesus. Our gospel lesson relates the typical pattern of God's activity through Scripture. Namely, God acts first. Then our response to God's action is praise and thanksgiving. To see God's hand in what has happened and give thanks. God did not tell the Israelites in Egypt, only when you have enough faith, then I'll lead you to the promised land. No, God led them out of slavery just as they were. Jesus did not tell the ten lepers, if you have enough faith, then I will heal you of your disease. No, Jesus cleansed them all. In the same way, God does not tell us, if you have enough faith, then I will send Jesus to forgive your sins and give you new life and freedom. No. It was because we had no faith that God sent Jesus. Paul writes to the Romans, God proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't wait for us to have enough faith. God acts first. God's actions are to lead to a thankful response. The gift of faith that we pray for the faith modeled by the Samaritan leper is the ability to see, to see God at work in and through Jesus. May God grant us this kind of faith. Amen. Will you please stand for the affirmation of faith? We believe God created all that exists and continues to recreate the lives of those who trust. We believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of a loving God, whose purpose was to save a lost world and who now works in us and others through the Holy Spirit. We believe God is calling each of us to be the body of Christ, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, and to stand against the powers of injustice and prejudice. We are called to declare for all the world to hear, Jesus is risen, and we are his people. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
in gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all of God's creation. Gracious God, we give you thanks for bishops, pastors, and deacons. Inspire leaders of the church to proclaim your mighty deeds, that your saving faith may be known to all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Majestic God, we give you thanks for land and water, seed time and harvest. Break down boundaries we construct between ourselves and the rest of your creation. Bring renewal and restoration to places affected by pollution and deforestation. Hear us, O God. Mercy is great. Mighty God, we give you thanks for those in our community, nation, and world who work for justice and peace. Guide those who govern to act on behalf of those marginalized by race, ethnicity, or religion. Hear us, O God. Merciful God, we give you thanks that you hear the cries of those in need. Restore to community those who are stigmatized by illness, feel rejected, or who live in isolation. Send healing to all who suffer. Today we pray especially for Anne, Carol, Peg and Brian, for Shirley, Simon, the friends and family of Roger Jensen, the friends and family of Michelle Makes, and all of those we name before you now. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Faithful God, we give you thanks for the healing ministries of this congregation. Equip those who visit, care, and pray for the sick. Give insight to doctors, nurses, home health aides, and all practitioners of medical arts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your faithful people who have gone before us to your glory. This week especially, we remember Terry Hansen and Leroy Fowler. Renew our trust in your eternal promises of mercy, redemption, and new life. Hear us, O God. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Someone once asked, if God owns everything, why does he need our money? The answer, of course, is that God doesn't need our money. We don't give out of God's need for anything. We give out of our need. Jesus talked about money more than any other topic except the kingdom of God. He tells us that it's a pretty important issue, not because he cares about or needs our money, but he knows how important it tends to be for us. So even though we're not passing the offering plates, we still take time in our worship to mark the importance of giving to our spiritual lives. In faith, letting go of physical things and returning a portion of what we have to God as a sign of trust, a sign of thanksgiving, a sign of furthering his work in and through this place. Let us join in our offering prayer. Gracious God, in your great love, you richly provide for our needs. Make of these gifts a banquet of blessing, and make us ready to share with all in need. Through Jesus Christ, who sets a table for all. Amen. Spirit born of water and word, Spirit born, the promises heard, the life that overflows from grace is making me a challenge. 
this holy place spirit born in truth in my heart spirit born is where my life starts spirit born of water and word spirit born the promises heard the life that overflows from grace is making me a child in this holy place spirit born in truth in my heart spirit born is where my life starts will you please stand welcome to the celebration God supplies for our every need and gives us this meal to share. God, we thank you for the bread of life. As we come to the table acknowledging our shortcomings and our need to experience your presence in the bread and wine. God, we thank you for the cup of salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Jesus Give us faith to receive you in this holy meal. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated.
Will you please stand? God, who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Amen. Peace and serve the Lord, God is calling you today, go and tell gospel news everywhere. Go and peace and serve the Lord, God is calling you today, to bring truth and love to every nation. Go and peace and serve the Lord, God is calling you today. Tell gospel news everywhere. Go in peace and serve the Lord. God is calling you today to bring truth and love to every nation. Go in peace with Christ beside you. Thanks be to God. God's peace, everyone. Have a blessed week.